This is Chris Marion, and you're listening to the Queen Bee Sessions. Conversations with Women in Conservation. Today, I have the great pleasure of having a conversation with my friend and former fellow Wisconsin Women in Conservation coach and coordinator, Jennifer Nelson of Humble Pie Farm in Plum City, which is on the banks of Plum Creek. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It sounds kind of familiar. <laughs> yeah. So, um, hi, Chris. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm so glad to be here. I've I've missed you since I've um, I'm not doing the Weebic coordinator position anymore, and I'm I'm shortly out of that. And so it's nice. It's so nice to see you and talk with you, um, and be here. Yeah. So we live on we live on the banks of Plum Creek. Um, and, and Laura Ingalls Wilder was, uh, born about 30 minutes south of us. And actually we're at the confluence of Rock Elm Creek and Plum Creek is about a mile away from where we are. So that's kind of cool. Lots of wild plum trees still, you can see them. That's just amazing. As long as I have worked with you, I did not put those two things together. I mean, I've always thought Humble Pie Farm in Plum City was such a charming name, but it gets better and you get better all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer is a certified organic bedding plant grower, which means she farms baby plants and then she gives them to other people to raise up. So I think Jennifer, now you're growing veggies and flowers and herbs for people to take home and plant. Is that right? Yeah, that is right. we we have, um, we sell to nine stores in the Twin Cities. So then they set up their green houses in the parking lots and, and sell our plants um, that way. Um, right now we have a very full greenhouse and uh, yeah, we're going to deliver next week. So it's, it's kind of exciting. We've been doing this for, we've been do, selling plants primarily for two years Prior to that, in 2013, we started growing cut flowers for sale. And, and then before that, we started out as certified organic vegetable farmers. So we did that for a while too. So gone through a journey, a journey of farm enterprises. And um, we've been on our land here on the banks of Plum Creek for about seven years. And we have 16 acres. Well, it's so romantic. And for those of you listening who don't already follow Humble Pie Farm on Facebook, you should because it's kind of chilly where I'm at. And I love seeing you work in the greenhouse. And you are really great with your live Facebook feeds. I think it's wonderful to watch you work and just talk about the everyday things you're doing. So thanks for sharing part of your life with us. Yeah, thanks so, for being interested. It's it's fun to, you know, you get kind of isolated or lonely sometimes and you're like, hey, world, here we are. <laughs> yeah. So if you need a little bit of plant love and a calm presence, check out Humble Pie Farm and that Facebook feed is wonderful. Well, how did you get into farming? I mean, you've you've pivoted a couple of times to try and um, adjust so that things are better for your family and for the market. But how did you get started? Yeah, well, um, I started working for a farm in 2009. And before that, I, um, I actually was a farmer's market manager, kind of kind of came into that serendipitously and, um, and did that I, um, I have a teaching degree. So I taught kids for a while. And, um, and I was always the, the teacher who had the, the children's garden. And I was, you know, was working, growing things into whatever I was teaching because kids and growing things goes together really well. Um, so in 2009, I started working for a, for a vegetable farm in Minnesota and, um, and worked there for a few years and actually met my, my current partner, Mike, there. And then we got married and started our farm business, Humble Pie Farm in 2013. And you kind of have a 16 acre children's garden now, because tell us about your son. <laughs> That's true. Or, or I guess like, um, 
Yes, it's a children's garden with a lot of stuff <laughs> laying around because he constantly has projects, lots of projects <laughs> going on. Um, yeah, so I have a nine-year-old son uh, that we homeschool, and it's it's great. We love it. It's um, it's you know organized chaos, but it's a farm is a pretty great place to to be a kid and to be with a kid. And we have a great community here. We're thankful for that. And so we have a lot of friends that come over and spend time with us outside. And yeah, we, we don't, um, we've become more of a farmstead. So in the last two years specifically, um, we, as we've been just doing the nursery business, um, then with our land, we have become more of a farmstead. So we're, we're working on a couple of projects, but we grow, I always have to grow some flowers. I plant perennials every year. I, you know, we have a lot of stuff. We have meat rabbits, we have chickens, we have um, aspirations of sheep and some other things. So anyway, we can get well, I, more into that. Well, I know that in your work with WeWIC, you are trying to connect women with NRCS um, programs, but you are also in the middle of your own journey with implementing conservation practices, working with different agencies. Can you tell me a little bit about what that's like and kind of what your dreams are for your farm? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have 16 acres and it's um, right now seven acres is in hay ground. So our neighbor cuts it for hay. We were doing two acres of flowers and some food. Um, and, and now we're not really, we've done a lot of cover cropping. We've done a lot of, um, you know, just like putting in some perennial clover and some things like that. Um, but we've kind of been, I, we've, we've been through some different, um, changes over the last few years due to Lyme disease. I've had Lyme disease and we can talk about that if you want a little later, um, but it's caused us to make some different choices, right? And um, and so, given that um, we have, uh, you know, we've we've gone through a few different um, like plans for what we wanted to do here. But right now, the the way that we're going, and and this is part of why, you know, just being, I, I learned a lot working with WeWick, and it was great, and I. Um, and I was able to connect with our NRCS agent here in Pierce County, which is the county that we're in, um, and then have him come out and walk our land. And then um, we're working on getting a grazing plan set up so that we can work on some, um, some funding for fencing and some pasture to have some sheep, um, maybe some goats. We'll see. Uh, it kind of it depends on what I can talk my partner into. <laughs> As far as what we nice that scenario. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, if it were up to me, it would be, you know, we'd be, we'd be forging ahead, but that's why in our relationship, I'm the, the person who's like, let's do this. And he's the person who's, who says, okay, so what are our steps to take to get there? And <laughs> so we balance, we balance like that. And I'm thankful for that. Anyway. So I've been working with NRCS. Um, to, to work on getting some funding, I need to start working on that again, uh, going into this season and WeWIC has been really helpful just in like resources and, um, and connections, connections. It's all about like, I'll never forget last year we did, um, this summer webinar series and Rachel Barreso was one of the guest speakers. She's a, she's a farmer down in South Eastern Wisconsin, I think. And she said, I farm for roots. I farm for roots. So I think about that a lot. Like that's, we, we have so much grass and we love grass fed lamb. I love grass fed lamb. I could just live on that. So yeah, so that's one of our big, that's one of the big pushes that I want to go towards. Um, other than that, I mean, I, I plant perennials every year. We, we pl we're working on a little orchard um, with some different things on one part of our ground. Um, we, you know, we, we used to have a cut flower. We used to have two acres of cut flowers. And usually the way that you harvest flowers is, you know, you try to get them before they're at peak 
pollination, or you plant varieties that are, that, you know, are hybrids that don't, that are pollen free, because that's what people want in cut flowers. So it's a little different way of doing things, but we would always have patches of, um, you know, different things. I remember one year we had this patch of verbena, which was like, uh, just amazing. I mean, there were so many bees and monarchs and it, it was, it was awesome. So we always would leave patches of flowers around the farm when we were doing cut flowers. And I, and I try to do that now we do a lot of annual flowers. Still, I do a lot of like Tithonia and um, Rudbeckia and yarrow. And I guess yarrow is a perennial, but I, I just sunflowers. I try to do a lot of just variety of flowers. And then we do have more and more perennials. That is my, that's like one of my things is that every year I plant some perennials, like even if it's just one, even if I've been so busy doing cut flowers or whatever, if I just get like one lilac tree in the ground or whatever, like then I've done my job. <laughs> well, you, it sounds like just such a peaceful and nurturing place. And I know to you, it's a controlled chaos because you're managing it and there's a lot going on. But I think that you really have a gift for um, setting things up to be peaceful. I, I think that's something that you value and you want in your life and something that you've provided to others in the form of plants and flowers. Talk to me about the importance of farms like yours, small family homesteads that are um, very niche oriented, but also very driven from a conservation perspective. What is the value of that to your neighborhood? You know, Chris, that is such a nice thing to say. And I'm kind of tired right now in the thick of greenhouse season. So I'm feeling a little emotional. <laughs> that is so sweet. And, you know, I mean, it's really, it's really interesting how, um, conservation like goes hand in hand with health and whether that's like physical health or emotional health or community health or whatever, like the health of the land directly relates to the health of the people. And so I think in these rural areas, um, I mean, that is something that is really, really important to me is that, um, in, in my little community in, with my little farmstead, which, you know, 16 acres is a small little piece of land, relatively speaking. But what I want with this is a place, uh, you know, like a, a haven. I want it to be a place where people can come and, and rest and, and breathe deep and walk around and, and feel peaceful. And, and I want to feel that too, you know, and, and, you know, some of that is why I've had to make some, some hard decisions of letting go of some things, but, um, but yeah, it, and, and certainly, like you said, like for me, and, and I think for any farm mom, it's like, some days are just, you're like, what am I doing? This is crazy. Time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Like most of spring, probably for you, right. you, you're doing all the work before other people get in the garden so they can take those little baby plants and put them in the garden. Well, I feel like I'm taking a deep breath, just talking about this stuff with you. I wrote down this awesome quote, the health of the land directly relates to the health of the people. I think that's so beautiful and so relevant in a time when we have anxiety about the climate and the direction that things are going. We wonder what can we do how can we influence this big, 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 giant, intractable, sticky, wicked problem? And I think what you're doing on 16 Acres is a great model for how we can all have an impact in our little corner of the world. You mentioned um, Rachel Baressa, who is another WeWick conservation coach um, from New London, and she's a grazer. And... Um, I learn a lot from her. She's very quotable, just like you. I wonder who else you have learned this style of farming from. Who do you go to to learn? Who have you, who have you really leaned on up until now? Uh, yeah. So, you know, I really, um, 
I've worked for Moses for uh, the Midwest Organic and Sustainable Education Service. So I worked for them for about seven years. And just um, as I ended my role with WeWIC, then ended that my time with them. Um, and I, I really made a lot of connections with great longtime farmers um, who are working to farm the land in a way that benefits the land. Um, and, and so even I, you know, I, I guess I would cite Linda Hawley. She is the farmer that I started working for when I started farming. She was the manager at, um, at the farm that I worked for in Minnesota and she's a long time organic farmer. Um, so I, I feel like I learned a lot from her. Um, there's a, a lot of other women that I've learned from, you know, and just really like, um, you know, Faye Jones started Moses. Like, I, I feel like there's a lot of women that have had a powerful, um, effect by the work that they've done that I've learned from also. And I think this is more, uh, more recently, just like in my progression as a person, I've really started to learn from, um, from indigenous farmers and from just, uh, farmers that are even like foragers, people that have been connected to the land, um, for a long time. And I, I came into farming through like, um, you know, like production farming, right? Like production vegetable farming. And so I, and I worked on a larger, like a mid-scale farm with a lot of machinery and a lot of land and stuff. And, and so like coming to my own land, which is smaller and I, we had, you know, way less machinery and stuff. It's really forced me to like, um, just zoom out and really like, um, instead of seeing farming as a business, like really seeing it as a, as a way of connecting to land and connecting to people and not that it doesn't need to be a profitable business. I'm, I'm not, um, I am very farmers need to make a living. I absolutely believe that, but I, but I feel like I've learned some other ways of thinking about land and thinking about how we treat land and thinking about how we connect to it. And even like owning land, you know, like that sort of, um, like we, we own this land, but do we, <laughs> you know, it's like a, it's like a, um, it's just a different way of rethinking relationship with land and with people. So are there books or, or are there books you'd recommend to people or websites or how can other people get in touch with that mindset? Yeah. You know, I follow a lot of um, people on Instagram and I am just kind of blanking on things right now, but one book that was really, um, that was just very good for me to read was Braiding Sweetgrass by, oh, I yeah. think it's Robin. I can't Wall Kimmerer. Yeah. Robin yeah. Wall Kimmerer. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a really good book. And that's kind of a, it's a good entry point, I think. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm blank. I'm a little tired. So I'm blanking on like any other like names of the accounts that I follow, but you know, there, there are some great, um, beautiful, wonderful growers and foragers that are, um, that are kind of leading the, leading the way with some really innovative ways of thinking. Well, it's so incredible that you would agree to talk with me in the middle of your busiest time. I really appreciate it. But I also think that the idea that we do get tired in the middle of farming and that it is pretty hard, exhausting work is part of the story. So I appreciate you being your whole self here <laughs> on the Hollywood Squares, <laughs> where we're not quite ready for prime time, but we're keeping it real. I um. I wonder about hope. Um, you're a very gentle soul. You have, I, I just think you have a really light touch. And you also have your own history of health issues and you're honest about them. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk to me about hope and where you find it and um, 
yeah, like where that, where it leads you. Yeah. I, um, I, I really value, thank you, Chris. And I, I value like being able to, to t- talk about this and just to, I, I love hope and I love, um, I love to remind myself and others that in the face of, you know, everything that we've been through and even just like the last three years, like, like there's so much reason to hope. And I think one of the things that you can, that, that will prove that to you, like even this year when the spring is so long and it just keeps snowing and blowing and, (laughs) and the sun shines every other week for 20 minutes. <laughs> um, uh, you can see the, the green grass coming up and you can see the buds on the trees and you can, you know, you can see it's, it's coming, it's waiting. And, and when it gets here, it'll be, it'll be glorious and it'll be delightful. And I think there's a lot of hope in, um, I mean, for myself, like I, I really have a strong, um, I would say I have a very strong faith and I, I have a, also just like a faith in, in people and in the land. And I, I think that those, you know, like I said before, I think that those are like, you know, really directly related. And so this conservation work and like working with nature in, in allowing it to just like do its beautiful thing because it will, you know, it always will. And, and we can, we can like steward it and we can act in ways that will help foster that. And I think that, um, that, that is, is really hopeful too. And, and we can do that with people as well. And I, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about that actually lately, just like in, you know, um, like I said, we, we homeschool my son. And so, and, and just being a former teacher of children, like so much, you know, you think of teaching as like this, you know, direction, but, but really so much of really good teaching is like offering um, conditions for learning and then Mm -hmm. being there and waiting (laughs) and like stepping in if you need to, but like waiting. Right. So you like, you like open this space for this and then you, you know, help it or guide it as you can. And, um, and that is really hopeful to me. I mean, I have to remind myself of that all the time, but nature is patient and nature is very, um, nature is very forgiving. I think like Mm -hmm. there's, there's so much, uh, there's so much like rhetoric and like media stuff about, and, and I know, I mean, I'm not like we, (laughs) this, the wind and the weather events this spring, like I'm not being Pollyanna about climate change at all. That, that is very much my reality as a small farmer, but also like, why is that, you know, why is that happening and how can we fit into that to, to help make Mm -hmm. it better? Mm -hmm. Right. So what is nature teaching us with all these big weather events? How can we learn from that? Yeah, that's really wise. Tell me about your own health journey. How did you, you have, you have limes. How long have you been living with that? And how does it impact your farming life? And what are you doing about it? Yeah. So, um, I, you know, it's, it's such a, limes is such a thing that a lot of people deal with and Um, I had it when I was a child, I was like 10 or 11 when I first had it. And I don't even know if I told you this part of my story before. Um, I had it, I was so sick, I would come home from school, and I would go to bed, and then I would get up in time for school the next day. And I just kept getting sicker and sicker. And thankfully, so this was like in the 80s, thankfully, I had this forward thinking pediatrician that found it. And I went on um, IV antibiotics for two weeks, and I started to get better. And I still had some residual like arthritis in my knees, um, like until I was about 20 or so. And then my, the rest of my adult life, I've been pretty healthy. So I don't know if I got bit again, or if it was just in my body, because then what happened was that I had a baby and then I 
um, started working full time and I was farming full time and working full time and not sleeping and not, I was basically living on coffee and ibuprofen. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been there. They're, they're like Which, vitamins, right? They're roughly the same shape. <laughs> if we're talking about like sustainable practices, okay, that is not one as I, as I well know. So I really think that I, I, it, maybe I got bit again. I never had a rash or anything, but I, I think what happened is that I burnt out my body and then the Lyme came back. And so I, it took me a couple of years to actually get a positive test. I knew there was something wrong. I was so fatigued and I was so achy. It was, it was really hard. Um, anyway, I finally got a positive test and then I went through some different things what has worked for me is um, I go to a chiropractor. I do a lot of herbs. I've done some different herb protocols. Um, I have a homeopathy. A homeopathy. Um, <laughs> so like, I'm sorry, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Homeopathic <laughs> practitioner. She's awesome. I love her. I adore her. I used to farm with. Her. I knew where you were going with yeah, that. We, I yeah. <laughs> She sends me these remedies. It's, you know, all the things like all the alternative medicines, um, not all of them, but many, my, my, my regimen that I have now is really working well for me. So, um, yeah, so Lyme's has been a challenge and it's been, a. um, I'm in my, so I finally got, I knew I had it in 2018. I mean, I knew I was sick 2019. I finally got a, a positive test and I was 2022 and I, I mostly have it under control, but I have to be really careful about sleeping really well, eating really well and not being too stressed. <laughs> so, you know, just those things, which, which I think is true for a lot. You know, I think, I think a lot of people deal with this and, um, and it's amazing, yeah. like what your body can do given, you know, given the right conditions, but also, yeah, we have to be really careful. Well, it strikes me that the way you talk about the farm and the land and the weather is really similar to the way you're talking about your body that we, um, can learn from the stormy bits and the, and the fatigue and yeah. what we need to learn is what is sustainable and, I really appreciate and admire you for sharing so honestly that, you know, you pushed too hard and you got burned out. But I think so many farmers and certainly women farmers who are also mothering and in mm -hmm. some cases doing elder care at the same time, you know, we just want so much to succeed on our land and we want so much for the world, <laughs> you know, so we, um, yeah, we can go too hard. What, um, what advice would you give someone who's interested in a lifestyle like yours, uh, farming or homesteading? Um, I think you've given a lot of advice as we've gone along embedded in, in what you've been saying, but if, if a young or a new farmer were to come to you, someone who wanted to buy land, what would you tell them? Um, I would tell them, um, I would say like, start small, I think like, you know, don't, and, and, and don't get too attached, you know, like, mm -hmm. like you can, you can have a beautiful little homestead farmstead on very little land. And with, you know, just, I, I think one of the things that I did that I regret, um, and you know, part of the reason, I don't know. Anyway, one of the things that I did that I regret is that I put so much of my energy into my making my farm business work. And I really missed like from when my child was three to six. I mean, mm. I was there, but I was, I was very busy and I wasn't feeling well and, and all that. So, and now I am sad about that because he's nine and he's really tall and he's <laughs> only getting, he's only getting bigger and smarter and, and all of that. And I love that too. But, um, I don't know. I would just say like, you know, I, I've 
you know, mentored some farmers lately and, and stuff. And, and I feel really like proud of them because they are, I feel like they're much more balanced and like keeping their family first and like, you know, enjoying that time. Like it, it, I just feel like I success and like being productive was such a, um, was so important to me. And, and, and I think those, you know, I, I'm, I'm not like, I don't, I, I appreciate what I did. Like it was fun and I loved the flowers and I'm glad that we got to do that. Also, uh, going back, I, I wouldn't do it the same way. I would, I would go smaller and I would, um, spend more time with my son and, you know, just, and take care of myself, take care of myself. You're right. You know, the limes, I, I always say in, in a lot of ways, it's been a gift because it forced me to like, and it continues to force me because that's my tendency, right? I want to like, let's do this. Let's like change the world and do all these things. And really, I just need to sit down and drink my tea and read a book with my son, (laughs) right? Like that's what needs to happen today. So, and that is changing the world, right? Like that, just that, yeah. Yeah, I do think that, those of us in the world of sustainable ag and regenerative ag have such big, big lofty goals. Like you said, big picture things that it's hard to rest in the mundane and even appreciate the beauty that we have on our farm. So as we wrap up, I know that it's spring now it's muddy. You might even have some snow still on the ground where you're at or sleet. But it's not in the pretty. corners. In the corner. No, <laughs> yes, it is pretty. not a pretty time. <laughs> but what is, can you describe to us what your farm is like um, at your favorite time? What is the your favorite time on the farm uh, in the farm year? And what does it look like and feel like and smell like? Yeah. Well, I, I have really two favorite times. We're we're really high up. We're at about, I mean, really high up for the Midwest. We're at about 1,100 feet. So you can see for a long ways and we have big sky. You can see lots of sky. And um, and so I love spring like a month from now yeah. <laughs> when everything's come up and everything's like really pretty because it's fresh and new. All the leaves are like not windblown. They're all like fresh and intact and this beautiful, like, you know, vibrant colors and it just, everything smells fresh and it's, um, it's fresh and it's green and it's light and it's new. And I love that. And then I love fall when it's dying and it's, you can see the colors for miles and it's, um, yeah, it's just so, yeah, I, I do love it here, Chris. I really like, I, I love my, I love my place where I've landed on earth because it is, really beautiful. And it, I don't know. I just, I love standing outside. (laughs) I love standing on my ground. (laughs) I just like feel, it makes me feel so happy. Sometimes, you know, when I get like heady and like stressed out and all that, if I just like go stand outside and sorry, my cat is getting pet by the computer. (laughs) I'm trying to keep her from like entering the frame. Oh, well, thank you so much. That image of just when the place in our head gets too confused and and disordered of going out on our land and just standing there and soaking it all in. It really is the gift. <laughs> laying down, just go lay outside on the land and just like breathe deep and close your eyes and just like feel the earth. <laughs> it's I great. love that. It's I great. love it. I love it. Well, thank you for this little moment of hope for the year that is to come because it is coming. You're right. Can't stop it. It's going to, it's going to come. We're going to have spring and we're going to have hot summer and then we're going to have fall and it's all going to be good. Well, it's been such a pleasure um, hanging out with you for the, this year and some of the Wisconsin women in conservation project. And it's been a real delight to go a little deeper with you in this conversation. Me, for me too, Chris, I, I loved my time with WeWick and it's been so cool to get to know you. You are so cool. 
And I, I just can't believe you do so many cool things. Well, we're I'm, all yeah. lucky to have this work and I am going to come visit you. If you don't mind, I want yep. to be on the banks of Plum Creek. <laughs> I have to pull that book out again and see. And after I visit your farm, I'm going to read yeah. the book again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Come anytime. Well, Jennifer Nelson of Humble Pie Farm, bless you in your new adventure um, and with your feet planted firmly on your place. And thank you so much. Thank you so much.